Good evening and welcome to First Thursday at the Marin County Law Library. This is our last event of the year. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge and thank the staff of the Marin County Law Library. Stephen Richards returned to us this year to assume the role of Law Library Director. He successfully, with his staff, has reopened the Law Library to the public. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, the Law Library is open 9 to 6. On Friday, it's open 10 to 1. This represents a more fully fleshed out schedule for public access than we have enjoyed during the last two years of COVID. May I note that Stephen quickly resumed our Lawyers in the Library program and forged strong relationships with both Marin County Legal Aid staff and with the Marin County Bar Association as he helped bring this back online. We are also working on new programs that we hope to introduce next year, and they are currently under development. At the same time, an upgrade of computer and electronic systems for the library is underway. Please take a moment to join the board and myself in acknowledging Stephen and his staff as they continue to grow the law library. In that spirit, we celebrate the sixth anniversary of Lawyers in the Library. We invite those in need of a legal consultation to join us next on January 26, 2023. We recommend both early registration online at our website. At this time, the program, just like this one, continues as a Zoom offering. I would now like to introduce a special guest tonight, and that would be a former board member, Elliot Bean, Elliot, who began his career as a law professor, has limited his practice to civil appeal since 1982 and was originally with the San Francisco firm of Bronson, Bronson, and McKinnon, where he chaired the appellate department. Elliot went on to start his own appellate specialty firm in 1990, originally with two partners. Elliot has been certified as an appellate specialist by the California State Bar since 1997 when that specialty was first recognized. Elliot Bean has been active in bar and bench bar programs. He founded an appellate courts committee at the Bar Association of San Francisco in 1985, and that eventually grew into its present appellate section. He served as president of the California Academy of Appellate Lawyers in 2002-2003. Elliot went on to found, found a series of bench bar lunches for professionalism at the First District Court of Appeal in San Francisco in 2004, and went on to serve for several years on boards of the Marin County Bar Association, and we are grateful to save the Marin County Law Library. The gentleman has also published and spoken frequently on legal ethics, professionalism, as well as appellate advocacy and procedure. We are delighted tonight to introduce Elliot Bean as our speaker. Elliot, thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. I want to thank you also for your long service as a board member at the Law Library, and especially your hard work over the years in building up this um, very important program called Lawyers in the Library, which um, I've now had the privilege to uh, add another job to. <laughs> And also to our librarian, Stephen Richards, who runs the program and has helped me plan this, this whole project. And I, I owe a great deal of debt to both of them. Um, before I begin, I also want to mention that we have two very prominent and esteemed uh, guests who are attending tonight. Uh, one of them is uh, Beth Robbins, who is the chief clerk at the First District Court of Appeal. And the other is Joy Robinson, who used to be the appeals clerk at the Marin County Superior Court. And very recently, the first district grabbed her away and she's now working at the first district as a legal assistant. Either of them could give this program as, as well as I could. So I'll have to really do a good job. Um, my subject today are appeals in civil cases, not criminal or juvenile cases. And mainly civil cases that can be appealed up to the court of appeal, uh, such as cases where the amount being claimed is at least $25,000 plus some others. But in the course of the evening, I'll also be mentioning 
some smaller cases as well. And my first topic, um, resources for people without a lawyer, might be relevant to any civil case, no matter how much is involved in it. There'll also be time for questions at the end, but if anybody has a question as we go along, please please let me know and I'll take a break and have a, have a glass of tea and we'll go along from there. What I wanna do first is let you know sort of what I'm covering of this evening. First will be the matter of resources for people who are self-represented. Secondly, I'm gonna basically go chronologically through the appellate process and particularly areas that I think people really need to know most about and also areas and issues that are, that are dangerous, frankly, uh, for people who don't know the rules well enough or what some of the issues are. So I'll be focusing on those problems. So starting with the first item, um, resources for people who don't have a lawyer, otherwise known as pro per or in propria persona uh, litigants. Um, this is not to embarrass Denise and Stephen, but really the best local resource is right here at the Marin County Law Library at 20 North San Pedro Road. It provides free 20 minute consultations these days on Zoom with an experienced attorney. And until, until now, until the next month or two, the, the subjects that they have are like family law, landlord and tenant and other things. But starting on February 23rd, they're gonna be sponsoring free consultations on civil appeals. And I've rounded up a number of quite experienced appellate lawyers who are willing to volunteer in addition to myself for these kinds of consultations. So I hope you hear about it. I hope you let us know. Um, the other place to contact is called the Legal Self-Help Center at the Marin County Superior Court. And um, I've been in contact with them. They're going to know about this program as well as all the other resources for people in Marin. And that's also a good place, a good place to start. Um, the clerk's offices at the Marin S Superior Court and the First District Court of Appeal, they're there, they have information. It's very awkward sometimes for them to answer people's questions. They do try their best. And what they might start to do is start referring people out to services like ours which I think would be very helpful for people. Um, so let me, let me leave it at that for now. The other kind of resource, another kind of resource are publications. The, the, the leading publication on civil appeals is by my good friend, John Eisenberg, and it's called Civil Appeals and Writs. A very practical, very thorough guide to the whole process. Another solid publication is called California Civil Appellate Practice published by an organization called Continuing Education of the Bar. Um, finally, there are solid chapters on appeals and some other publications. One famous one is, is by uh, Bernard Whitkin, uh, the, the late Bernard Whitkin, uh, called Whitkin on California Procedure. There's some good chapters on appeals. The other resources that I discovered only recently in preparing for tonight's uh, presentation there are some wonderful forms by the body that supervises all California courts. It's called the California Judicial Council. They have a number of forms, usually on procedures that you have to fill out. And that's often a question that comes up uh, to a lawyer or to a self-represented person. But they have a short and terrific summary of appellate procedure in a form called APP-101, or app, short for Appeals 101. And the way you find that in all other forms is on a website called courts.ca.gov, G-O-V. That's courts.ca.gov. Then you click on forms and rules. Then you click on find your form. And then finally, for this purpose, you click on appeals. And then you go down the list and you look for app 001. And it's maybe a dozen or more pages of great information on on how to appeal to the Court of Appeal. That same resource has a, has a wonderful information form also. It's called App 101 Info. And that covers smaller appeals that are called limited appeals, usually where the amount is less than $25,000. And then you don't appeal to the Court of Appeal. You actually appeal from a Superior Court judge's ruling to other judges on the Superior Court that are assigned to what's called the appellate division. 
It may not sound very uh, comforting to appeal from one colleague to another, but that's what the, the, the rules and, and the procedure does, does provide for that. And that, that can be certainly a useful resource. Finally, in even smaller cases, which are called small claims cases, there's another form in that same resource in the Judicial Council form that you have to look under after search for forms. You have to click on small claims, not on appeals, but form SC100 and, and the following forms cover the appellate procedure for small claims cases as well. There are also another set of resources that are online. And the best one by far is also established by the California courts. So you get to them once again by going to courts.ca.gov. And then you click on self-help. And then you can choose either civil appeals or small claims. And either one has a wonderful set of written information and sometimes videos and forms and resources that are, that are very, very helpful uh, to, to, to check on. Um, under civil appeals, for example, one of, the, one of the best ones that jumped out at me are topics called steps to appeal. And it goes through each steps and does um, sort of what I'm trying to do tonight is to give you basic information about each step. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource. Finally, um, there are legal agencies, legal organizations that can provide legal help by lawyers to self-represent the people who cannot afford to pay for it. The Marin County Bar Association has one list of so, such agencies, about six of them. And the way you find that out is to go on the website called marinbar.org, M-A-R-I-N-B-A-R.org. Then you click on resources, and then you click on um, community legal assistance, and it gives you the list names and addresses. A much bigger list is maintained by the California State Bar, which is the organization that supervises all attorneys in, um, in, in, in California. And their website is called calbar.org, C-A-L-B-A-R.org. Then you click on public, then click on need legal help, then click on free legal help, then legal aid groups currently funded by the state bar. And there are almost a hundred organizations in the state that do provide free legal help if you meet their particular criteria and what your particular case might be, what your, what your um, orientation is, whatever it might be, it's there. So those are the basic resources. If you're interested in the next step, if you're interested in trying to find a retained or paid lawyer, I want to start out by saying that it is possible to save a good deal of money on that endeavor by hiring a lawyer for a limited purpose. I've done this myself, and I'm sure other people are willing to do it. For example, an attorney can help the client just evaluate the appeal and get started with it, which as you'll hear in a minute is, is one of the most difficult phases, just evaluating it and what, you know, how to get started, what, what you have to do. Um, and so then you go to, um, all right, so that's fine. The other, the other resource uh, is at the state bar again. Um, I'm sorry, I got lost here. Um, the other resource is, is, is called the Lawyer Referral and Information Service. And that's sponsored by the Bar Associations of San Francisco and Marin. And to get there, it's in the San Francisco website. It's called sfbar.org. Then click on the Lawyer Referral and Information Service. And they might be able to uh, give you some names of attorneys who would be willing to, to um, uh, to help. I guess I lost my train of thought. Another limited purpose that might be very valuable if you hire an attorney is just to look at a draft that you have prepared of your brief and, and comment on it and give you some ideas for it. That could be a very short, very short, maybe less than half an hour. I mean, an experienced lawyer could look at a brief and within half an hour, give you some good ideas on what to change, maybe how to start your introduction differently, maybe some issues you want to add or drop from the case, give you some comments about writing and so forth. So those kinds of expenditures might be, might be very, very helpful. Um, the, the last place to look for one, if you are really interested in trying to find a paid or, or retained appellate lawyer, 
The state bar maintains um, a list of appellate specialists, certified appellate specialists. And the way to find them is to go to calbar.ca.gov, G-O-V, then click on public, then find a certified specialist, then click on appeals, and then you can either select a particular county um, or you can just click on all counties and look, look through the list. Marin has only five or six people in that category, but I'm sure other people in the Bay Area would be willing to help somebody from Marin as well. So those are the resources. I hope that I hope you found that helpful. Um, I'm now going to turn to the chronological line of, of procedures for the appeal. And the first one people don't always think about, but it's quite important. And that is protecting your right to appeal when you're still in the trial court. People say, what? Wait a minute, I don't have to worry about the appeal until I'm, until I'm in the appellate court. Well, not so. The appellate courts, just to give you the overview here, the appellate courts believe it's unfair to the trial courts and also a potential waste of judicial resources to raise an issue on appeal that could have been, but was not raised with the trial court first. The appellate courts believe parties should at least give the trial court a chance to make the right decision and thus avoid the necessity and cost of an appeal. So with very limited exceptions, which I'll mention in a moment, if the party appealing does not raise an issue with the trial court first, the appellate court most likely will not even consider it. They'll declare the issue waived or forfeited, and that would be quite a blow to, to your hopes on the appeal. The limited exceptions are when an issue you want to raise on appeal involves nothing but the proper understanding of a statute or other rule of law. One, two, the opponent could not possibly have sought to present any evidence on the issue if you had raised it. Think about that. Some issues that you might raise, the, op the opponent might say, wait a minute, I want to submit a witness on that subject. In that case, the appellate court will not consider it. And finally, the third qualification is that no disputed facts are involved. If all those criteria are established, the appellate court at least may consider an issue for the first time, but they're not required to. And I've, ha I've had some good luck on those kinds of issues, um, but you have to meet the criteria before you even can hope for that. Now, a related problem is that the appellate courts won't just take your word for it that you raised an issue in the trial court, or for that matter, that something else important happened in the trial court. There's a frequent saying amongst, among people in the appellate world, lawyers and judges, if it's not in the record, it didn't happen. Appellate courts are officially called reviewing courts for a reason. They're asked to review what happened in the trial court and pass judgment on it. And they can't do a proper review without official information about what actually happened. Nor do they consider it their job to gather such information. The only one responsible is the party asking them to review an issue and pass judgment on it. The party who appealed, which is who is known as the appellant. And the appellant is held fully responsible for any missing information. If they did not provide it on appeal, the appellate court will very likely reject any issue affected by the missing information. So be forewarned. So while you're still in the trial court now, thinking about maybe you'll appeal, maybe the other side will appeal, be sure to request on the record, whether in writing or orally, any significant ruling you want and be sure you oppose on the record any ruling you don't want the other side wants. Otherwise, you'll very likely be barred from pursuing the point on appeal. And if any significant events take place off the record, which is often like planning for trial, who's going to go first, what days, who's going to present what evidence, sometimes very important discussions take place off the record. No court report, maybe not even a recording. And if any such events take place off the record, be sure to confirm on the record at your next opportunity anything significant that happened. That's a judgment call, but keep in mind that it's something to think about. Similarly, if the court doesn't allow you to present, present evidence on a particular subject or, or by a particular witness, make a summary or what's called an offer 
of any evidence on the record that you try to submit to preserve your right to appeal on that issue. For the same reasons, if there are any significant hearings in your case, such as a trial or an important motion, try to get the hearings transcribed by a court reporter. And that's a problem these days uh, because there are fewer and fewer court reporters, unfortunately. If you appeal and there was no court reporter, however, there are some alternative methods to establish what happened at the hearing so you can preserve and argue the issue you want to argue. Um, two of them are called an agreed statement or a settled statement for, for the larger or unlimited cases. Um, the rules are rule of court 8.134 and rule 8.137. And the same alternatives are available in smaller cases as well. Uh, those involving less than $25,000. And the rules there are rule of court 8.836 and 8.837. In addition, in smaller cases, the limited cases, there is a possibility of using an official electronic recording rather than a reporter's transcript when one is available. So keep that in mind. Finally, this is something that even a lot of lawyers do not know. If a party believes that the amount of money awarded um, if the defendant was too high and if you're the plaintiff, it was, the amount of, was too low, you must move for what's called a new trial in the trial court to complain about the money being too high or too low, or the appellate court will not consider the issue. It's a requirement, very much like you have to prove what happened to be at the, at the trial court. So this is an important issue. Okay, that's how to protect your right to appeal in the trial court. Now I wanna mention what I consider alternatives to an appeal. And there are two kinds, post-judgment motions in the trial court or a settlement. Yes, some settlements happen at a very late stage of cases. The motions in question, I'm not gonna go into detail, are a motion for a new trial, or to modify or vacate the decision. And, and, the, and the statute there is the California Code of Civil Procedure, section 657. And that lists the grounds and other sections describe the deadline and the procedures. Another motion is just to vacate a decision and enter a different one. And in the same code, it's section 663 and the following sections. If there's been a jury trial, the dissatisfied party can file a motion to enter what's called a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. And there are certain grounds for that as well. The statute is the same code, section 629. And also there's a motion called for reconsideration. If you can cite, quote unquote, new or different facts, circumstances, or law. Tough, it's a tough, <laughs> a tough burden to find those, those kinds of things, but they sometimes happen. And the statute, again, is the same code of civil procedure, section 1008. Now, the other alternative that I think more people should consider is to try to settle the case. Frequently, parties who win in the trial court either believe or pretend to believe that, of course, they'll win in the appellate court, too. This kind of this optimism. Those kinds of parties, if they really believe that, aren't interested in settling. Similarly, the parties who lose in the trial court sometimes feel absolutely certain and angry that the loss was the result of prejudice or worse. So they're sure that the appellate court will see that and they'll win the appeal. Well, even I'll talk about that kind of argument in a minute, but even if parties hold such beliefs sincerely, they might still be motivated or persuaded to consider a settlement. It would save them the time and money they'll have to spend on an appeal and of course avoid the risk of losing. Parties should also consider participating in a mediation um, before starting an appeal or even after starting it in the early phases before much time and money has been spent in pursuing it. And at the end of the day, at least try to get a candid opinion about appellate chances from someone knowledgeable. Either do one of these consultations at the Marin County Law Library, and hopefully maybe some other places, um, you can get a 20 minute consultation about your chances of winning an appeal. And while you're not gonna get technical legal advice about your particular case, you'll get information that I'm about to mention in the, the second topic 
which will help you evaluate how good your chances are. And if they're not very good, I'd say consider very strongly um, pursuing an appeal. Can happen. Okay. You decide you're going to go ahead, or at least you figure you, you might. The next big question, and this is one of the difficult and dangerous subjects. Question is, can you appeal from a particular ruling? What rulings are even appealable, even are possible to appeal? Now, the ultimate resource on this and all my topics are state statutes. And the relevance, most of the relevant statutes are found in the California Code of Civil Procedure, Title 13, called Appeals and Civil Action. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but they are listed in unlimited cases in the Code of the Civil Procedure, Section 904.1. And you can find that in the library, and I might be providing some copies of some of the resources I mentioned, so the law library will have them for you. Um, section 904.2 of the same code lists the fewer types of appealable rulings in the smaller limited cases. And there's also a right to appeal in small, case, small claims cases, believe it or not. And the rules are, are set forth in a different section of the code, starting with section 116.710. Other codes, however, uh, list specific types of rulings that can be appealed to the Court of Appeal. And the two main ones are the Family Code and the Probate Code. Under the Family Code, there's a great listing of appealable rulings in the official comments to section 210, 210 of the family code. It's probably a dozen or more different kinds of rulings um, in family cases that you can appeal from. As for the probate code, also just as many, if not more. Um, and you look at the probate code sections 1300 to 1304 dealing with trustees and other fiduciaries, guardians and conservators, powers of attorney, advanced health care directives, and decedents of states. A lot of subjects that may well come up for self-represented people. Now, now for the problem. You can look at those lists of statutes themselves, but the first and the main type of, of ruling that's appealable in both unlimited and, and unlimited and the limited cases are a judgment. And that's sometimes very difficult to identify. What's an appealable judgment? The only definition in the statutes is in a different section, in section 577 of the Code of Civil Procedure. And here's the definition. Quote, the final determination of the rights of the parties, unquote. For several reasons, that definition is simply not very helpful for appeal purposes. First, and there are about three different problems. First, the definition does not make clear that a judgment is appealable if it's a final de determination between any one plaintiff and one defendant in the same case, even if the case involves other parties too, and their rights have not been decided yet. Going back to the definition, it says the final determination of the rights of the parties. People may well understand that to mean the rights of all the parties in the case. Doesn't, it doesn't apply to what judgments are appealable. It's often said, and even in published appellate opinions, that there can be only one final judgment in each case. Not so. If there's more than one set of adverse parties in a case, more than one plaintiff versus one defendant, a final judgment as between just one of those sets of parties is appealable. And you've got to appeal. For example, a single plaintiff might sue several people or several different companies, often do, and there might be a final determination as to one of those defendants before the others. And here's the danger. This is why it's dangerous. If you wait to appeal until there's a final determination as to all the parties in the case, you might well lose your right to appeal from the first appealable judgment. Once there's a final judgment as to one set of adverse parties, the clock starts ticking on the deadline for an appeal for, as to those parties. And that deadline cannot be extended or excused 
by either the trial court or an appellate court or the Supreme Court or the United States Supreme Court. Nobody, nobody can extend that deadline. It's treated as absolutely firm. Okay, that's problem one. Is it really a final judgment? Another problem is this, and it's also with the official definition. The, fine, the definition, the final determination of the rights of the parties. A very reasonable implication of that definition is that all rights of the parties must be determined before the judgment is appealable. Not so. Now, the, de the definition is accurate to the extent that a judgment is final and appealable as to all what I'll call substantive claims between one set of parties. It might be those set forth in the plaintiff's complaint against the defendant or that same defendant's cross complaint against the same plaintiff. And by substantive claims, I mean a party's basic allegation that they're entitled to a legal remedy because of the other side's alleged conduct, reaching a contract or some other obligation, violating a statute, committing negligence or whatever. But here's the problem. A judgment is treated as final and appealable, even if certain rights have not yet been determined, even between that one plaintiff and the one defendant. And that's a big problem with that definition that I mentioned. Um, most often, the problem arises when whether the party, when the party who prevailed on the substantive issues is also entitled to pursue an award of that party's litigation costs, that party's attorney's fees, or prejudgment interest on the amount that party was awarded by the, by the substantive ruling. Even if all those rights remain undecided, costs, fees, prejudgment interest, the judgment that determined the substantive issues is still final and appealable. And the danger is the same here too. If you wait to appeal until all those other rights are also determined, you may well lose the right to appeal from the substantive ruling and the substantive judgment. Here too, the clock starts ticking on the deadline to appeal, even though those other rights have not yet been determined. Another warning, it's important to mention that the title of the document, even if it's called a judgment, is not determinative of its appealability. Even if it's called a judgment, a ruling is not appealable unless it's actually a final determination of all substantive rights of the particular parties involved. Often enough, unfortunately, a so-called judgment leaves some substantive rights unresolved. The most frequent situation is that cases are often divided into different phases. Maybe damages, maybe the liability first, damages later, or what's called a, an equitable issue, then a, then a legal issue. And unfortunately, a so-called judgment, a document called a judgment, is sometimes entered after that first phase of the case alone has been decided. Conversely, a ruling not called a judgment can still be appealable like one if it does, in fact, finally determine all the substantive issues between one set of adverse. I hope you got that. Uh, I don't want to repeat it now, but the bottom line is this. Don't rely on the title of the document. Read it to see if it's actually appealable. Finally, one last danger. And it doesn't come up that often, but it does come up. The law is dangerously unclear about the effect of an, of an amended judgment. In particular, the question is whether parties have to file a timely appeal from the original judgment anyway, or just from the amended version or both. I've even proposed a rule change on this subject because it is so dangerous because the law is so unclear to keep people from guessing wrong, but the Judicial Council hasn't acted on my proposal yet. The only thing that seems clear is that an amended judgment that does no more than adds an award of costs or attorney's fees or prejudgment interest, that does not change the appealability of the original judgment. So even if the court enters an amended judgment, adding those things, the original judgment is still the appeal of the one. But even so, my advice to clients and attorneys who ask me is always be safe. If there's any doubt, and there often is, about what's the effect of this amended judgment, I always advise them to appeal on time 
from both versions of the judgment, the original and the amended version, just to make sure you don't lose your right of appeal. Now, if the, if the amended judgment is delayed quite a bit, a second filing fee might be required. You can't just amend your notice of appeal. Um, but that's a couple hundred dollars I'll get to in a minute. And it's, I think it's a relatively small price to pay filing a second appeal and paying the fee. Uh, it's a small price to pay to ensure that you don't lose your right to appeal. Okay, you've satisfied that dangerous ground. You know when to appeal, what judgment you appeal. The next question is a very, very important. Should you appeal, how good are your chances? The first and most important question is how successful your appeal will be. Here's some background, which is often a, an unpleasant surprise to my clients who want to pursue an appeal. Over many, many years, and the courts keep statistics on this, roughly 20%, only 20% of all civil appeals have been successful, producing a reversal of the judgment. So I also tell clients and trial lawyers who contact me that even appellate judges who are known as justices in California, they're very important people and very powerful people are quite human. And therefore they have a variety of personal values and personal inclinations. So it makes for unpredictability about even the strong appeal. So I've always defined statistically a strong appeal as one with closer to a 50% chance of success, rarely above that. And a weak appeal, unfortunately, is down between five and 20%. That's the cold, hard reality. But what, what makes an appeal stronger or weaker? Naturally, an appeal can be fatally weak. It's not going anywhere. If a point was not raised with the trial court first, or important information is missing, or you missed the deadline to appeal, which I'll get to in a moment. But assuming there's no technical problem, the strength of an appeal does not always depend on how good your particular argument is viewed independently. Let me say that again. Obviously, a good argument on a particular issue is better than a weaker one, but there's another factor which often is even more important. And that is the type of issue that you want to raise on appeal. So there are four main types of issues that are relevant for this purpose. I'm going to start with the strongest one and then move on to the fourth, which is the weakest type of issue. The stronger, strongest type is a case involving what are called purely legal issues. The most promising type of issue is limited to the applicable law where you're arguing that the trial court did not correctly apply a statute or a constitutional provision or some other rule, and that its correct application compels a better result for you here in the appellate court. This is the best type of argument because the appellate courts take them most seriously and rule on them completely independently without any deference to the trial court's decision. And I'll talk about deference in a the appellate courts also believe that their most important task is to interpret and apply the law correctly, and not only for the benefit of the parties to the case, but also for the benefit of the lower courts, the legal profession, and the public at large. So they're going to look at these purely legal issues with the greatest interest. Now, what makes this type of issue purely legal is in part that it involves the law, but the other side of the coin is that the issue does not involve any disputed facts. As I'll explain in a moment, when the relevant facts are disputed and the trial court resolved them against you, your chances of success on the appeal go way, way down, well below 20%. That's just the problem. Okay, the next type of issue, the next, the next strongest issue, is where a claim was dismissed without a trial. This is the next most promising example. And, and well, the, the most promising example is where a party's claim was dismissed at the pleading stage 
even before you start getting discovery, where if somebody challenges the sufficiency of the complaint that the plaintiff filed, and the trial court ruled that the claim was insufficient, even if you accept all the allegations as true, as you often must. You've probably heard it said that everyone is entitled to their day in court. And what that means is you're entitled to a trial on the merits of your case. You don't get thrown out prematurely. That's, the, that's what the saying means. And there's a pretty strong policy of the law to that effect. People, the appellate courts do believe that. So appellate courts do closely examine why particular parties were denied their day in court, were denied a trial. And in addition, there are usually no disputed facts on such an issue, which could weaken your chances of winning. They're just looking in this case at the complaint's own allegations. A similar example is where a claim is dismissed on a motion for summary judgment or a similar motion, also taking away the right to a trial. And the appellate courts do look closely at these types of cases. The third type gets you down into the weak area. The most common one is where cases involve disputed facts. As I suggested, this is one of the most frequent and critical weakness in a civil appeal is relying on a disputed fact. While appellate courts consider their highest duty to interpret the law, they consider it the duty of the trial courts to resolve all disputes about the facts of the case. Was the light red or green? Did the neighbor really do or say that? In all such cases, the appellate courts strongly defer to the trial court's factual finding. If almost any competent evidence at all supports the trial court's finding, the appellate court will very likely affirm it, even in uphold the decision, affirm it, even if most of the evidence presented cuts the other way. It's such a strong deference to the trial court. Unfortunately, many appeals still challenge cases with disputed findings they don't know or whatever. And that's a significant cause of that 20% or lower success rate. The fourth uh, type of very weak uh, cases and probably the most weak is are cases involving the trial court's discretion. Um, many trial court rulings are considered discretionary. For example, deciding whether or how long to continue a trial, which of several proposed trustees or conservators should be appointed or whether to issue a request an injunction, and if so, for how long and what to The list is quite long, and it's essential to find out if your particular issue does involve trial court discretion. Um, the appellate courts defer even stronger to discretionary rulings than rulings on disputed fact issues. So be aware. Second category of issue in evaluating is even if the ruling was incorrect, did it actually make a difference for you? If you persuade that the trial court's ruling was incorrect, you must then persuade them that the error was actually harmful for you, or as we say, caused prejudice for you. You must show there was at least a reasonable possibility, not a certainty, just a reasonable possibility that the outcome of the case would have been better for you had the trial court made the correct decision. So no matter how strong your argument is, and even if the appellate court accepts it, it then has to ask itself, did this error really make a difference? And if not, unfortunately, the appellate court will not reverse the ruling. Hard rule of barriers. Final question about evaluation is one that even some experienced lawyers completely ignore. What, is, what benefit will you actually get from winning the appeal? It's often assumed that winning, even by trial lawyers, it's often assumed that the winning party on appeal will get everything they were hoping to get from the trial court. So if a plaintiff was seeking money or some other benefit from the trial court judge or a jury, it's often assumed that a winning appeal will result in, award, in an award of that money or the other benefit, and the case will end on that happy note. Or if a defendant is appealing or ruling against them, it's often assumed that a win on appeal means the entire case against them will be thrown out. But that doesn't always happen, my friends. It's very common, in fact, that winning an argument on appeal only keeps the litigation going for another phase, that the case, even if there was error, the case must be sent back to the trial court 
or further proceedings based on the appellate court's ruling. Only if the only exception is where all the relevant facts are undisputed and the trial court's error went to the substance of the case, not some procedural error, then you have a chance that the appellate court will rule that one side or the other will win the case and the case will end on that on that basis. But that doesn't always happen. Okay, that's those are the issues on the evaluation. Now the questions are in fact somewhat similar, simpler. First one is when and how must you start the appeal? The deadlines, as I mentioned at the outset, are fixed, unmovable, and no court has power to excuse a missed deadline, even for the most compelling reasons. So it's essential to find out right away what your deadline is and of course comply with it. You can always drop the appeal later if you don't, if you change your mind about it or if you settle. But if you miss your deadline to start the appeal, you're, you're out of luck. The only exception to the prescribed deadline is where the Chief Justice of California has declared one or more 30 day extensions of time for all affected parties or for a particular area of the state because of an earthquake, fire, public health crisis, or some other emergency. Uh, this happened recently, for example, in the early stages of the COVID uh, emergency. So now you know the deadline and now how do you start it? Pretty straightforward. They're always started by filing and sending a copy to your opponent of the very short and straightforward document or the notice of appeal. And keep in mind that you always have to file it in the same court where the ruling was made that you're trying to challenge. The clerks in that court then report the filing up to the appellate court. In unlimited or larger cases, the rules on notices of appeal and the deadlines are found in what's called in the California Rules of Court beginning with 8100. And the form is called APP, APP-102. And I told you before where you go to courts.ca.gov, click on forms and rules, then find your form, then appeals. As to when to start the appeal, in these larger cases, the most common deadline is 60 days after the clerk or the opponent sends you either a file stamp copy, excuse me, of the judgment and order, or a document called notice of entry of the judgment. And there's no extension of this deadline, by the way. If the document is mailed to you, as is the case with many other court documents. There's also a sort of a drop dead 180 day deadline starting from the entry of the judgment, no matter if it's never been served on you or a notice of entry. Um, if, if you've never uh, received uh, a copy of the judgment or order or notice of its entry, you still better find out what's going on and find out why the delay. And if the delay is getting close to 180 days, you better start your notice of appeal anyway. Um, in smaller cases where the amount claim is less than 25,000, the rules on appeals are set forth in, in the same California rules of court, rules 8.820 and 8.821. For example, in those cases, the main deadline is 30 days from notice of entry of the judgment or copy, rather than 60 days as in the larger cases. Okay, next subject. Pretty straightforward. When you file your appeal by filing a notice of appeal, you've got to pay a filing fee. So let's talk about the filing fees quickly and then the way to get out of it, the way to get a fee waiver. Um, in, in unlimited cases, the filing fees for starting the appeal um, amount to $875. And those are due at the time you file your notice of appeal. In a small limited case where the amount is between ten and twenty-five thousand um, dollars, where your appeal is to the appellate division of the same court, the filing fee is only uh, three hundred seventy dollars. For starting an appeal in even a smaller limited case where the amount is less than ten thousand, it's two hundred twenty-five dollars, and the usual filing fee for a small claims appeal is only seventy-five dollars. Trickier question, somewhat more expensive, can be more expensive. Are the fees due at the beginning of the case for preparing the record on appeal, which is required for the documents and transcripts that must be presented to the appellate court in order to pursue your appeal? Um, 
The usual method is called the clerk's transcript. There's a collection and an index of the relevant documents in the case file. Um, and that's in the California Rules of Court Rule 8.124. And the filing fee is covered in that initial $875 fee. But another way to limit costs, if both parties agree, is to have the clerk's office submit the original court file to the appellate court. And the rule there is rule 8.128. If so, you have to get a certain stipulation form and get your opponent to agree to it. And you can find that out in the website I mentioned before, courts.ca.gov slash documents slash record stip dot PDF. You can, I'm sure you can find it. Now, <coughs> excuse me. If any hearings are important to the appeal, the usual way to submit them to the appellate court is called the reporter's transcript. In smaller cases, an electronic reporting might be available as an alternative. Um, but I also mentioned the other options are called either an agreed or a settled statement, which is simply a summary. The cost for a reporter's transcript can be pretty much, they're based upon the number of pages involved. And it's best to get an estimate from the court reporter because they're usually a much lower number than the estimate that's prescribed by law if you don't have an estimate. Those estimates are based upon um, $650 a day for each hearing if it exceeds three hours or $325 a day if it's less than three hours. Now, there's a procedure called getting a fee waiver based upon your economic cir circumstances, whether you're on public assistance or, the, or your family income is low. And the California recognizes that. There's even a wonderful form um, that I've mentioned on the Judicial Council forms. It's called app APP-015. It tells you all about the fee waiver system um, under find your forms and then appeals. Unfortunately, though, California does not allow fee waivers for reporters' transcripts, which can often be the most expensive. So for reporters' transcripts, you've got to shout out the money and request a reimbursement the following way. There's a Court Reporters Board of California, which represents court reporters. They maintain what's called a transcript reimbursement fund. And the application can be found at that organization's website, Court Reporters Board, no spaces, courtreportersboard.ca.gov. Then click on the word TRF, which stands for Transcript Reimbursement Fund. Then click on Pro Per Guidelines and Application. That's where you find the information and the application to submit for a fee waiver. Be forewarned, however, that the fund is pretty limited and often runs out fairly soon each new year. Now, both in unlimited and limited civil cases, no later than 10 days after filing your notice of appeal, you must also file with the trial court, not the appellate court, what's called a notice designating the record on appeal. And you must likewise send that a copy to your opponent. The form in unlimited cases is called APP-003. And in limited cases, the form is called APP-103 and actually contains a lot more useful information than the uh, form I mentioned for. Um, unlimited cases. Now, in small claim court, no such form is required because the clerk automatically transmits the case file to the judge who's going to handle the appeal. So I've already talked to you about the need for a transcript. There's no need for uh, to repeat that. And the, the there is a on the form itself, um, there's a box you can check asking for the fees to be waived based on that you've already gotten an order waiving the fees or that you've even applied for a fee waiver, then you don't have to submit the, the cost of the reporting. Um, and I've already mentioned the other alternative, an agreed statement or a settled statement, which are available both in unlimited and limited cases. Now, as far as the written case documents, that record de designation form gives you three um, options that you can choose by checking one of the boxes. The least expensive is the call using the original superior court file. 
if both sides agree. And that's permitted for both unlimited and limited cases. The second option, and the second least, and the next best option economically, is called an appendix. And it's also available in both unlimited and limited cases. Under this option, either the appealing party alone or both sides together collect and provide an index for certain required court documents, such as the judgment and the notice of appeal and other relevant documents. And the completed appendix need not be filed and should not be filed until the first appellate brief is filed by the party appealing. And that makes sense because only when that first brief is ready to file can the parties truly determine what court documents they really need to make sure the appellate court gets. And then you can make sure to include them in your appendix if it's up to you. Finally, the third and most common option is called the clerk's transcript. And it's not really a transcript. It's very similar to an appendix. It's a collection of documents that are indexed. But the work is done by the trial court clerks. And they charge a fee for that service, which can be waived as I mentioned. This option, unfortunately, is also the one that's most likely to delay your appeal because the trial court clerk's offices these days are, are quite burdened, excuse me. So that's the record has starts 10 days after you notice the appeal and it's, it's quite important. The first, the next step in the appeal is a very simple short document, but it's required. It's called a civil case information form and you can find it, it's number app, APP-004. It must be sent, filed and sent to your opponent within 15 days after you get a notice from the trial court clerk that the appeal has been filed. Um, and as for filing this first little document, um, it is usually filed by the electronic filing system that I want to just briefly mention to you. Um, um, you can, our appellate court, the first district appellate court, has a rule, local rule number 12, that sets forth the procedures for electronic filing of documents. And almost all lawyers must file documents electronically rather than on paper. And once again, go to courts.ca.gov, click on courts of appeal, then first district court of appeal, then forms and local rules. And I should mention to you that self-represented parties are exempted by that rule from having to file all their documents electronically. They're perfectly welcome to do so, but they need not do so. Next, and once my almost my last serious subject here is the all important appellate brief. Once the record is filed, the appellate court will send out a notice that, that they've received all required elements of the record, and you get a notice establishing your deadline to file your first brief, along with your appendix, if you chose that option. The deadlines are set forth in the California Rules of Court, Rule 8.212 for unlimited cases, and Rule 8.882 in limited cases. Um, let you know that the extent that extensions of time for briefs are available and generally speaking pretty liberally given their importance. Um, you can even get a stipulation if the other side is willing to extend your, the time for your brief. As for the briefs themselves, Rule 8.204 establishes required content. Um, and 8.883 does so for the small limited cases. But aside from the acquired content, it's just as important to choose your arguments carefully. Um, the choice should reflect the same evaluation I mentioned earlier this evening. Candidly determining the strength or weakness of your various possible arguments. Your brief should only present the strong arguments. And if only one is strong, limit your brief to that one. Limiting briefs this way is always a very wise tactic. The, first of all, the appellate judges and their staffs will appreciate your judgment and consider the arguments you do select in that positive frame of mind. Conversely, however, if you include weak arguments in your brief, your entire credibility as an advocate might well be compromised. 
weakening the impact of your stronger arguments as well. Opponents, for example, often lead off their own brief by attacking your strongest brief, your strongest, by, I'm sorry, by attacking your weakest argument on the appeal and saying the whole brief is weak. See, Your Honor, look at this weak brief, they've, they've, with this weak argument they've presented. So you really want to avoid that. A strong brief also focuses on the issues themselves and does not make personal accusations about the trial court judge or your opponent. A strong brief persuasively explains why the ruling against you was erroneous, not why the judge or your opponent had bad manners or bad motives or whatever. Just explain why the ruling violated a relevant statute or some other legal authority and why you suffered a worse outcome in the case as a result of that error. I should warn you also that appealing parties cannot add new arguments for the first time in their reply brief after the other side has filed their brief. A reply brief can only try to rebut the arguments the other side made. So for this reason to your first or what's called your opening brief deserves your greatest attention and must be as strong as possible. Finally, the written briefs are far more important in winning the appeal than the oral argument that might take place after all the briefs have been filed. Now, trial lawyers often say their oral presentations are more important than their written presentations, but that's not usually the case at the appellate level. The justices and their staff take as much time as they want to study the case before they even invite the parties to request an oral argument. And during that very important preparation case, phase of the case, the written briefs submitted by the parties play a huge role. It's your best opportunity to persuade the court. In addition, in the great majority of cases these days, the appellate court will have already prepared a tentative decision on your appeal and a tentative opinion setting forth their reasons before the oral argument takes place. And the outcome rarely changes as a result of the oral argument. Once again, I'm not trying to complain about the system. I'm just telling you why the briefs themselves are so important to do accurately and with good judgment about what arguments. Last brief topic, the concluding phases of the appeal. Once the court finishes its preparations, prepares the opinion, has an oral argument if one, is, if one is requested, the court then has up to 90 days to file its decision. As a practical matter though, um, given the almost universal practice of preparing opinions ahead of time, it usually takes only a few weeks after the argument when the final decision comes down. And whenever it does come down, the parties have up to 15 days, 15 days to file what's called a petition for a rehearing. Basically that asks the court to reconsider one or more points in the opinion that they issued. Now, occasionally such petitions do result in a minor correction or clarification of the opinion, but for the most part, these petitions are simply denied uh, without comment. So don't, don't put too much hope on it. Finally, and this is finally for the evening, Parties have the right to petition the California Supreme Court to take up a case after the Court of Appeal has decided. But they don't have to take up the case, and it's pretty rarely, pretty rarely happens. The only realistic chance of that happening is where the Court of Appeal's decision conflicts with another Court of Appeal's decision on the same issue, and the issue has substantial importance, not just for the parties, but for the entire state. Moreover, most Court of Appeal decisions these days are issued privately only to the parties alone, and they are not officially published, as it's called, as required for such an opinion to count as binding precedent in other cases. So if your case results in only an unpublished decision that can't be cited in other, in other courts, the chances of persuading the Court of Appeal to take up your case are even smaller, even if the issue does have some importance. Um, just look at independently. Um, I have finished my presentation. Thank you for your patience. 
if anyone has questions of me, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, I see we have a couple, one more person on from earlier on. So let's pause for a moment. I won't feel offended if anybody has a question or does not. Um, if not, it's been my pleasure to um, compress my many years as an appellate lawyer into a one hour presentation. It's been challenging for me, but it's been a pleasure. And I do hope it's helpful for you. So thank you very much and good evening. We are very, very grateful to have had you tonight. We are grateful for the direction that the lawyers in the library program will be moving in. And we look forward to a new year. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite those that are interested to join us for our first event next year. And we will be welcoming um, the folks from the Marin County Civil Grand Jury. Thank you. Happy holidays. Wait, sorry. Stay healthy. Yeah, uh, there is one question from JR. Uh, sorry, JR. I apologize. Yeah, there is a question. Apparently. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, Please. hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, hello, Mr. Bean. Um, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. Um, I do have a question for you. I think a lot of the propers are interested in the question whether the Court of Appeals will consider correcting possible mistakes made by the trial court if they do not spot them in their Court of Appeals opening brief. Can, can the appellate court do that for them? Short answer is yes, they can do whatever they want and, and often do. <laughs> um, I'm, I, my main purpose tonight was to warn people about the rules that they must be, you know, be aware of and try to protect themselves from. But um, yes, there's no problem. There is a rule um, on, 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 on petitions for rehearing. Now it's very discretionary for the Court of Appeal. If, if you're not happy with the result, you ask the appellate court in one of these petitions for hearing, please look again, please do the right thing, please correct your errors. Or they don't have to. There is a there is a rule of court though that if they address an issue, and I'm, I'm, I believe my memory is correct on this, I might check the rule, you might check it to be sure. If they did, if they address an issue in their opinion that nobody briefed, then they must grant a rehearing. And I forget exactly what the procedure they have to follow, but that is a protection for the concern, uh, Joy, that, that you're, you're raising. So yes, it can happen, but it usually doesn't. They'll usually resist doing that. Now, one other way, they, another way they, the Court of Appeal can address that, if during the course of their review of the case, they look at the briefs and they think of something they think of an issue that the parties did not brief. And they don't want to just surprise the parties and, and make a, a rehearing petition automatic. What they often will do is send a letter to the parties, whether it's self-represented or represented parties, and say, we would like you to submit a supplemental brief. In fact, it can't even be an order. I've seen orders to that effect, not just a letter. The court hereby directs the parties within 15 days to submit a supplemental brief addressing X, Y, or Z. And then, of course, the parties have an opportunity to do that. Even later in the process, if there's some new issue or some new twist occurs to them closer to the oral argument, or even the day before the oral argument, they will sometimes issue what's called a focus letter. Even the day before you open it, you look, you're checking the court file, your email inbox, and all of a sudden you get a letter from the Court of Appeal. It says the Court of Appeal would very much like the parties or one side or the other to address a particular issue at the oral argument. And so they're inviting that. It can even happen as you, and I've seen it happen as you're walking up to the, to the podium at the oral argument, the presiding justice say, well, Mr. Bean, um, we would like you to start off by addressing this question that's come up. And then you do your best, address it right there, a good tactic for a lawyer or the self-represented party at that point. 
said, well, Your Honor, that's a very fine question. I'm so glad you asked me. And I'd like to submit a letter to the court answering it. It's a very complicated issue. It's so important that I want to think about it, you know, for at least a few hours. And I'll probably do you the courtesy of letting me do that. Um, so th those are the ways that issues that are not briefed uh, can come up before the court. Excellent question. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. <laughs> so at the um, at the Superior Court in Marin, we sometimes had pro per uh, litigants who or appellants who were not completely clear about the extent to which filing an appeal would effectuate an automatic stay of the lower court proceedings. Right, right. And that caused some difficulties. If if is there any um, any light you could shed on this topic easily? <laughs> I didn't make my list, but it is a tricky. It is a tricky. It is a tricky subject. This general rule it's found in Code of Civil Procedure section nine one six that a notice of appeal automatically stays the judgment um, unless <laughs> unless one of the following rules applies. And the following rules usually say that an appeal only stays the enforcement of the judgment if you post a bond, a surety bond, or it's called an undertake. For example, if the judgment is for money, that's the most common situation. It's section 917.1 of the Code of Civil Procedure. Then you must get a bond or an undertaking um, from either a surety company that's in the business of, those, of doing that, or you can get what's called a personal surety. If you have friends or family that are willing to sign a document that says, if my friend or relative appeals and loses and is responsible for the judgment that was stayed, you know, the money judgment that was stayed, and interest grows on it, and if they don't pay within 30 days, which I think is, is, the, is the required requirement, then I'm good for it. You can come after me to pay that amount. And that's what the that's what the, um, the surety company. Other, other statutes requiring a bond involve uh, real property transactions. Let's say the judgment requires somebody to convey real property to the defendant or to somebody else. And the plaintiff says, no, I don't want to lose my property during the appeal. Well, you can get a bond for that. And usually it covers what the, what the cost would be, what, what economic loss the defendant would have if they don't get the property right away. It might be the rental value of the property even if it's commercial or, or, or a residential property. Then there are a bunch of other kinds of, um, kinds of cases where the, where the law, I mean, there are like 10 or 11 categories where, where the, uh, a bond or some other, some other condition is required in order for the uh, judgment to be stayed. One, one unpleasant uh, exception where you can't get a stay at all is where the judgment is called self-executing. If it simply says what the rights of the parties are, you have the right to do such and such or whatever, and no other agency of the court has to enforce that judgment against anybody. It just settles the issue you know, for the parties. And if somebody acts otherwise, there has to be some kind of new lawsuit. In those cases of self-executing judgments, a mere starting up of an appeal does not stay the judgment. That's perhaps an unfortunate rule. Makes you know makes winning a judgment a little bit less uh, attractive, but that that is the law in California. So the most likely answer is going to be probably some kind of a bond or undertaking would be would be required. Um, interesting. Some judgments require parties to sign a document, execute a document. And they say, well, I don't want to execute the document because that, the bad guy is going to use that document against me. One way to stay the enforcement of that, of that requirement is to actually deliver the signed document to the clerk's office at the trial court usually. And they keep it in a safe. <laughs> so. So the defendant can't use that thing, but it, it provides security because if the plaintiff loses the appeal and the appellate court says, yes, you've got to deliver that signed document, 
plaintiff lost the appeal can't tear it up or something like that. It's in a it's in a safe place, and the defendant can then, you know, they have to I think file an application with the trial court, you know, the trial court judge, to direct the clerk to release that signed document to the defendant under those circumstances. So again, it does provide security pending the appeal. Thank you. That was very helpful. Very welcome. Good question. Marilyn, do you have any questions? All right. Very I nice. sincerely apologize to the questioner I, <laughs> that I overlooked you. I thank you for joining us and health and happiness to all of you in the new year. Thank, thank you, you so much. Good night to all. Have a good evening.